following the book of James, if you've been tracking with what we've done with the book of James, it's not unusual for James to command his readers. This is the last of 55 commands. You want to know what you're to do in your Christian life? Read James. 55 times he commands his readers to do something. And one more time, he commands them. He says, let them, let him know. Let him know. That's a command, not a recommendation or a suggestion. That's something that the one who is responsible for turning back a Christian who strays from the truth is to do. And what is that person to do? They are to use their mental faculties. They're to use their mind and come to a knowledge of a certain truth. James is imploring the, the one who's involved in turning back the Christian who has strayed. He says, use your mind. Come to the point where you know Come to recognize how important this task is that you're involved in. What is it that they're to know? Well, in order to know that, we move quickly to our fourth point, And that's the results of restoration. When you understand the results of restoration, you'll realize how important it is to turn a Christian who strain from the truth back to the truth. What James wants him to know is given in the last part of verse 20, that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James said that's what the person who turns a sinner back is to know. And, and before he gives the results of restoration, it's like he said, let me remind you of the important work of restoration. I, I know I gave you a picture, turns him back, but I want to say a little bit more than just that. And so he says in that verse that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way. You see, the person who's involved in restoring, the person who's involved in restoration, that person is coming to a person who strays from the truth and is trying to help them get back on the right path. But what's pointed out here is that James says that the person who strays from the truth is a sinner. Did you see that? He's a sinner. And again, some people use that and say, oh, James is talking about someone unsaved. Or James is talking about someone who professes to be a Christian, but really isn't a Christian. No, when James uses the word sinner, it's the same word that he uses in James chapter 1, verse 15. When James was talking about temptation, he told us about the source of temptation. And he says temptation is never from God. He's not the source. The reason why we're tempted is because of our own desires being drawn away and enticed. And then he talked about the consequences of temptation, or the sequence. He said the person who yields to temptation, what does he do? He sins. And then sin brings forth death. Temptation yielded to results in sin. Sin produces death, eternal separation from God. And what James was trying to do there is to remind us of never ever have a light view of sin. That any sin that we ever commit, each and every one of those sins is worthy of death. And the only reason that it doesn't happen for the Christian is because Jesus Christ paid it all. That he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He paid the penalty for my sin. But don't ever forget that the worthy consequence of sin really is death. Eternal separation from God. 
But the reason we don't experience that as believers is because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He's paid the penalty for us. And now when James comes to chapter 5, verse 20, and he talks about the person who turns a sinner. He talks about a sinner. He's talking about one who is a believer, but is living like one who is not a believer. James used the term sinner in James chapter 4, verse 8, to talk about worldly Christians. And I just want you to be aware because there's a teaching, there are some good godly people who say that when James uses sinner, he's talking about someone unsaved. If it was Paul, that's a strong possibility. But James uses the word sinner only twice. He uses it in James 4, 8, and he uses it here. And what he says to worldly Christians, those who want to live like the world, he says the solution, the cure for worldliness is to cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And now here when James says he turns a sinner, he's talking about that a Christian who's gotten off the path and has chosen to do that which misses God's mark and God's will for his life. But not only that, James pictures restoration as not only turning a sinner, but turning a sinner from the error of his way. That helps us to understand what it means to stray from the truth. When you stray from the truth, you're involved in error. Error with regards to what? Your way, your lifestyle, how you're living day in and day out. And so this person who strays from the truth is further identified as one who has been involved in error concerning how he or she is to live his or her life. And James says, when you restore such a person, you are turning that person from the error of his way. You're getting that person off the wrong path and you're now getting them on the right path. They're no longer going astray or going that way. They're now living the way that God wants them to live. But the results of doing that, the results of turning a sinner from the error of his way, James says the first result is that you have saved that person's soul from death. Look again at verse 20. Will save his soul from death. That's strong language, my friends. To save a soul from death. That surely sounds like somebody who's unsaved. But no, as I mentioned earlier in James 1 verses 13 through 15 and kind of mentioned it too early, uh, the point is that James wants us to know that any time we sin, it is worthy of eternal separation from God. You don't have to do 10 sins. You don't have to do 100 sins. You don't have to do a million sins in order to be worthy of eternal separation from God. One sin. And that's why when people think that they're acceptable to God and they're trusting in their good works, because they think their good works outweigh their bad works, they miss it. Because all you need is one sin. And that makes you unworthy. It makes you guilty of breaking the whole law. And so James is saying that when a person restored, when a person is brought back to the truth, what you have done for that person is gotten them off the path, a, a path that is leading to eternal separation from God. Do you see how serious that path is? They're not on a path that leads to heaven. They're on a path that leads to eternal separation from God. They're on a path that leads to 
eternal damnation. They're on a path that leads to spending eternity in the lake of fire. And when that person is restored, you've taken that person off of that path and put them on the right path. Now you say, what happens if that person doesn't get restored? It could be an indication if that person stays on that path the rest of their life. It could be an indication that they're not saved. But if they are saved, then understand that Jesus paid it all, that they will not experience the, the end result of that path. But what James wants us to realize is that it's a serious matter. When you look at the results of restoration, we ought to want to cause people not to stray from the truth. We ought to want to reclaim them and restore them because they're on a path that leads to hell. They're on a path that leads to the lake of fire. That's no way that the child of God is to live. When God saved me, when God saved you, he saved us to live free from sin. He didn't save us just that we might go to heaven and continue down a path that leads to the lake of fire. He saved us to live a path on a path that pleases him. And so restoration results in a person's soul being saved from death. But the other thing that it results in is what James says at the very end of verse 20. He says restoration results in forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins will cover a multitude of sins. That's shorthand for forgiveness of sins. That's terminology that was used in the Old Testament for the atonement and the atonement covering sin. And now James is saying here that when you restore a strained Christian, then what you are doing is you're helping them to have their sins forgiven. Because if they continue on that path of straying from the truth, if they continue down the road that they're on, then they're going to encounter many sins. And they're going to be held accountable for many sins. And James says when you cause that person to get back on the right path, what you've done is that you've covered a multitude of sins. That person has for, uh, experienced the forgiveness of sins. And I don't know what is more precious for the child of God than to, for, to experience forgiveness of sins. When you're involved in helping a strained Christian get back on the right path, you're saving that person's soul from death. You're helping that person to experience forgiveness of sins. That's how serious it is to stray from the truth. Some of us have friends, loved ones, who are Christians, and we don't care about how they live. We don't say anything about their lifestyle. We can see that they're strained from the truth. And we think it's no big deal. And James is saying it's important, it's crucial. This is a task that is to be going on in the church. Because when you turn back a sinner from the error of his way, what you're doing is you're saving his soul from death. God is using you and me to save someone's soul from death. That's God's work. But God says in the life of the believer, I will work in the life of the believer and help that believer to cause another believer's soul to be saved from death and to help that believer experience the forgiveness of 
sins. James ends his book in a very strange way. It's not like the ending that you find in most books that are letters in the New Testament. You read Paul's letters and typically when you get to the end of Paul's letters, he's always saying grace to you. He's always extending grace because he knows that people need God's grace and he sends greetings. And sometimes he asks people to pray for him. But James doesn't end that way. James ends in a very strange way. Uh, some people have tried to help James out and they added something to his text and they said, amen, because James ends strange. I mean, the, the last thing that he talks about is the restoration of a strained Christian. What a way to end. Why not say goodbye? Why not extend us some grace, James? Why not greet so-and-so? James says, no, I end this way because I want it on your hearts. I want it on your minds, how important and how valuable and how significant it is to be involved in the loving and caring ministry of restoring a Christian who has strayed from the truth. James says, I've talked about trials and temptation. I've talked about all of these things. But when it comes to the end of the letter, the thing that I want echoing in your ears is the reality that Christians stray from the truth and fellow Christians need to make sure that they bring that Christian back. That's what he wants us to leave with. Out of all the marvelous things that he said in this book, all of the practical things, tongue control, wisdom from above, but that's not what is on his heart when he ends the letter. He wants to know, will you be involved in the important task, the loving task, the concerning task of restoring a strained Christian? Because that's what his book has been about. Everything he's written in this book to his readers is that he doesn't want them to wander away. He doesn't want them to go astray. And so he's taught them about temptation. So he's taught them about trial. He's talked to them about being a doer. Of the, he doesn't want them to go astray. And James says, my heart for you readers, I don't want you to go astray. But if someone does go astray, if a member of the Christian community does, does go astray, James says, I'm assuming that the other members of the Christian community care enough, love enough to turn that strained Christian back. And so I ask you, do you care enough? Some of you know some people